Okay, in the interest of, uh, of starting on time, and we'll let the commissioners get settled for a bit. And before, we're going to open the meeting, and we've been asked um, to move the welcome up before the roll call. We have some conflicting appointments, so if you'd uh, like to walk, come up to the mic and Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome, California Transportation Commission. I would like to officially welcome you to Stockton, California. My name is Mayor Anthony Silva. I'm the mayor here of the city of Stockton, and I'm also the chairman for the San Joaquin Council of Governments. I'm honored to have regional uh, transportation experts uh, in our city today. I'm also proud of the tough decisions that our local council of governments board has made, and more so, is the fact that I have a wonderful COG staff led by Executive Director Andy Chesley. He's a proven leader, he is compassionate about the less fortunate, and he has a vision for our future, and he also possesses a keen eye for talent. As you know, California has our share of challenges, especially as we efficiently plan for transportation needs, services, and issues. But I believe that none of you are here by accident. Your career paths have brought you here to California, for a reason. Although our state has many challenges, as you know, such as cutting multi-millions of dollars from a budget, we also have tremendous opportunity to serve the residents of this state. As you know, Stockton, California here, we've, we've faced our economic challenges as well, and we were once a bankrupt city. And today we have climbed out of that hole, and we are once again an all-American city. So. It's with great honor that I welcome you to our city. Consider it your home for the day or for the duration, as long as uh, that you're here in, in, in Stockton. And we just we're really appreciative of the fact that you came here for this event. So once again, welcome to all to you, and welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Do you have any other speakers? That it. Okay. Very good. Okay, then we'll open the meeting. Um, will we take the roll, please? Here. Commissioner Gilmetti. Present. Commissioner Gardino. Commissioner Inman. Here. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Madapo. Commissioner Avalani. Mr. Alvarado. Yes. Thank you. Um, we have three resolutions of necessity. Uh, we're one short for uh, the amount of commissioners that we need. Commissioner Gardino's on his way. So we'll move uh, right in, Andy, to the rest of the Welcome to the Region. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. It is a pleasure to have you here. And uh, thank you to the mayor. I did not write his speech for him. <laughs> uh, I wanted to just quickly run through uh, why we are very appreciative of the working relationship we've had with the Department of Transportation and the California Transportation Commission over the years. And if I know how to push this button correctly, um, maybe I'll be able to uh, run this uh, speech. <laughs> uh, San Joaquin County, uh, many of you are aware of San Joaquin County. You drive through here and going up I-5 or 99. Uh, we're the fastest growing uh, county in the state of California right now. Uh, we're a center for logistics for Northern California, particularly for the Bay Area and the East Bay. Uh, the Port of Stockton is uh, a huge component of our transportation uh, issues here in, in the area, we are pay considerable attention to it. Uh, we also have two intermodal rail facilities that are major hubs here in Northern California, both of which are expanding. Uh, and lastly, the jobs housing imbalance with the Bay Area is a driving force in much of our planning work. Uh, we've had a long history of partnership with the California Transportation Commission and Caltrans to help solve our region's issues. Uh, and we have a sales tax that was passed in 1990 and renewed uh, for 30 years in 2006. Uh, some of what we did, uh, the widening of Interstate 205 is an AB 3090 project. In fact, we've done three AB 3090 projects with the California Transportation Commission 
we're not really looking to do one right at this time frame, uh, considering the economic issues that we're facing. But uh, I think this is a, a testament to the good working relationship and trust that we've had with one another on many of our projects. We widened 205 uh, from, uh, from its four-lane uh, facility uh, to six lanes. Um, uh, and that was completed back in 2009. Uh, project lists that we are going through that with a bond measure, we've all these have been a part of our bond program. <laughs> this takes a little bit of time, I guess. Um, I-205 auxiliary lanes have been complete. The North Stockton Great Separation Projects, Archbury Expressway, uh, all complete. The Interstate 5 French Camp Interchange Project complete. State Route 99 Manteca widening is uh, complete. It was completed just this last summer. Uh, all these are projects that were parts of the bond program. Uh, Lathrop Road grade separation project was just completed. As a matter of fact, I uh, uh, won uh, an award from the American Society of Civil Engineers. A Navy Drive grade separation project was just completed this winter. I-5 widening and pavement rehab project is underway right now. You may have noticed it. Uh, pretty much everybody in the state has noticed it at some point in time. Uh, taking a little longer the door, I mentioned to Commissioner Gilmetti that my daughter got her driver's license. Uh, just about a month after the project started. She still has not forgiven me. Uh, State Route 99 South Stockton widening is underway um, and it should be complete um, by the very end of this calendar year or might just uh, sneak over into spring. And the Stockton Route 4 Crosstown Freeway extension is underway. And it's a marvelous project. Uh, uh, I certainly encourage anybody who would like to drive down the Crosstown Freeway to take a look at it. It is uh, quite an impressive structure. Uh, Archberry Expressway was completed. That's, uh, you've seen that uh, down uh, on I-5. That was a major uh, TCIF project. Uh, State Route 99 Matika widening, I mentioned that was completed. As a matter of fact, I was coming back here from Ripon this morning and we had a, a little uh, incident along there that I had to slow down for. But uh, this project uh, uh, has uh, gone from uh, four lanes to six lanes, and I think all of you are aware the Highway 98 bond program has been a marvelous success, a great working relationship between the uh, eight MPOs in the San Joaquin Valley and the Department of Transportation. I actually remember when Commissioner Gilmetti was chair of the commission right after the CIMA, CMIA program was uh, uh, decided upon. We came a month later, and uh, there was no uh, acrimonious discussion at all, and you complimented us on and that's the way it's been for the last eight years. We have been marvelously successful in terms of our work on Highway 99. <laughs> uh, South Stockton 99 uh, widening project is underway right now uh, from four to six lanes. Overall, the entire amount of bond programming uh, with the sales tax measure and local dollars that have been contributed as well as some of Caltrans shop funding on this program totals about $875 million here in San Joaquin County. About a half a billion dollars of that is money that you, the commission, voted um, directly to contribute to these projects. Uh, once again, South Stockton widening. Uh, more work done on here. Uh, it's underway right now, and it's, uh, it's by the end of the year, it will reshape the uh, southeast part of, of uh, the city of Stockton. I-5 widening and pavement rehab, the portion from uh, Hammer Lane South to Country Club is widening. It will be the only HOV lanes in the state of California. Uh, south of that is a pavement rehab project. It's, a, I think, a great partnership with the Department of Transportation to figure out how to make those two projects work together. It's taking a little longer than we expected. Um, out there, but it's a marvelously successful project uh, and one which the commission was uh, instrumental in terms of making happen. Uh, South uh, State Route 4 Crosstown Freeway Extension is out to the Port of Stockton, a brand new expressway entrance. It's, uh, it goes, it's quite an interesting project. It goes over Elevated railroad tracks. It'll be four and a half stories high in the air. As a matter of fact, it's already four and a half stories high in the air. I joked that we should have put a vista point on the bridge. 
Once again, uh, this uh, structure over the railroad tracks is uh, it, it's going to win uh, awards next year for the uh, uh, for the design and construction effort. Uh, currently, we have completed these. Uh, this is a brand new entrance to the Port of Stockton, um, and in a month's time, you will have a project uh, uh, to vote to uh, continue widening this Navy Drive. A project to be part of the TCIF shop program. So, once again, I would like to thank you for your continued investment in the region. It's been a great working relationship with the Commission and the Department of Transportation, and we look forward to, to continuing to do more projects uh, with you as we uh, continue on this $875 million investment program here in San Joaquin County. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. Andy, before you go too far, can I ask you just one question? Yes, um, fairly recently, you all in the region have completed a multi-county goods movement plan. Is that true? Can you give me a status on that? And who's the lead? Uh, on your side. We actually have um, a multi-county goods movement study underway with oh, the Metropolitan Transportation okay. Commission and the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, um, and that is underway uh, right now. MTC is taking the lead in that. It's only just recently begun. We do have another uh, multi-county uh, great uh, goods movement program among the eight regional agencies in the San Joaquin Valley. As a matter of fact, they met here yesterday. Um, going over the San Joaquin Cog is the lead on that effort, and it's concentrating on the goods movement balance between Highway 99 and I-5. Okay. Can you make sure that uh, our staff has the point people on those so we yes. can stay in the loop and stay informed? Thank you. I will do that. Thank you. Any other item? Okay. Uh, approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Motion by Gilmetti. Second. Hi, uh, Commissioner Dunn. Any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, <coughs> Commissioner's meeting for compensation. Motion by Tavaloni. Second by Inman. Uh, any other questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, under item eight, uh, before we move that a little bit forward, I want to congratulate Commissioner Dunn on her reappointment uh, to the commission by Governor Brown um, with uh, <laughs> bugs. Yeah. Um, with the uh, you know, confirmation process. Sometimes it gets a little muddy, and we lost Commissioner Simi. Uh, so Fran Inman has uh, stepped up to fill the uh, spot as vice chair, and we probably need a motion. I move. Confirm that. Second. Motion by Yvonne, uh, second by Joe. Any other questions? Actually, any other nominations? No questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, and with the changes that have taken place recently, and uh, my appointment as chair, I'm going to Appoint uh, to Streets and Highways Committees. Appoint uh, Gilmetti to replace myself. So the members are Gilmetti and Tavaloni. Of the Planning Committee, uh, appoint Commissioner Kehoe and replace Asimi. So it makes it Kehoe, Arp, and Inman on the Planning Committee. On the Project Delivery Committee, appoint uh, Commissioner Dunn to replace Asimi. So the members of that committee will be Dunn, Arp, Gilmetti, and Tavaloni. There will be no changes to the Aeronautics Committee, which are Commissioners Inman and Tavaloni, Mass Transportation, uh, Cordino and Burke, and Road Charge Committee, Medafra. Got it? Okay. Um, Executive Director's Report. All right. Commissioners, this is my first report. <laughs> um, wanted to just let everyone know that the exits, you see those there, and the restrooms are out here, and I know that there are restrooms around the, around the corner. I learned that from my former boss. Um, so, Commissioners, I uh, wanted to remind you that we do have a Tri-State Commission meeting that will be held in Portland, Oregon on June 16th and 17th. Uh, the agenda for this meeting will include road usage charging, advancements in vehicle technology, 
freight a discussion on the I-5 corridor, preparing for seismic Pacific Coast transportation infrastructure seismic activity, and it will include presentations, uh, some of which will be provided by Caltrans, the folks, Comia, GC, and Norma Ortega. Also wanted to remind you that we are holding a retreat on the morning of June 29th to discuss the annual report and other matters of interest to the commission. Since the commission met last, uh, we have held a town hall meeting in Chico. The town hall was held the evening of April 13th and the day of April 14th. Commissioners Gilmetti, Art, Medaffer, Inman, and Tavaloni attended. And Garth Hopkins will provide you with a short update of the information that was obtained at that town hall. Commissioners, um, there was, like Susan said, a Northern California CTC uh, town hall meeting on uh, April 13th and 14th up in Chico. It was hosted by the Butte County Association of Governments, BCAG. Uh, Ivan Garcia, I have to acknowledge his efforts. He did a fantastic job uh, in getting things organized. Uh, we had, uh, there was, uh, the agenda was a really good agenda in terms of the, the topics that uh, was uh, developed by BCAG. Um, several of them include the, the work that is going on up in Butte County relating to the ATP program and some of the projects that they have in the works up there. And then also we received an update on the, um, uh, the Northern California, the super region, uh, some of the, uh, the collective of the RTPAs, the regional transportation planning agencies have, have gotten together and meet periodically on issues of mutual interest. Um, we also took a tour of the, uh, the, the BCAG facility, the new transit oper maintenance and operations facility. And then also lastly, we took a tour of Route 70 uh, down from Chico down to Marysville and uh, looked at some of the projects that were recently completed and also uh, were, you know, looked at some of the, uh, the needed uh, future projects. So all, all in all, it was a very good town hall. And the Warriors, and the Warriors won at the pizza parlor we were at. <laughs> all right, and commissioners, I wanted to give you an update on staffing. Uh, we have appointed or uh, hired David Van Dyken to serve as a supervising transportation planner. David, would you stand up? David uh, joined us on, on May 2nd. He comes from the California High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, he um, was the Southern California Planning Liaison. He worked with uh, the Southern California folks on high speed rail station planning. He also has a background working for Caltrans as a planner. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Arts in Social Science and a Master's Degree in Public Administration, both from CSU Stanislaus. So he also has a Master's of Science in Transportation Management from the Mineta Transportation Institute. So we're pleased to have David on board. And, um, and the next appointment that was made is to appoint Christina Asori to serve as the Commission's Chief Deputy Director. Her first day at the Commission is June 2nd. Uh, Christina possesses the skills and abilities to effectively serve as the Chief of Staff and oversee the daily operations of the Commission. Christina is an accomplished attorney. She's currently working for the Vision Service Plan. She has a st strong background in business transactions, innovative finance, and um, P3 and design build. She has a BA degree, double major in psychology, and biology, and a political science degree from USC and she's also a Juris Doctor from Whittier College of Law and a Master's from Stockholm University School of Law. So uh, again, she will be, you will meet her in June. Make sure that concludes my report. Very good. Questions? Yes. I, I just wanted to add that while we were in Chico, we had a sustainability tour at the Sierra Nevada uh, Brewery. And no, but it was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> not that kind of sustainability, I know, I know. I'm not Vince, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, I saw you. No, but it was, it was absolutely amazing to learn from our business partners what they are doing uh, in terms of helping us all uh, protect our environment and increase our sustainability. So I just want to give a shout out to them. I think they're very good corporate citizens and appreciated the tour. And, but you neglected to say how good the beer was. I'll, I'll just add one. From a transportation standpoint, they do have a problem on 99 getting their trucks. They have, I forget how many trucks. 
go in and out of the brewery, uh, and they have two breweries. This is one in California, the original one, and they've just built one in North Carolina. And I'd hate to see them move out of the area if, if we can't help them solve some of the transportation problems up there. Any comments? <coughs> hey, commission reports. Everybody already gave a report. I have no report. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> From uh, News. From the secretary, undersecretary, I see that the seats are vacant, so we'll go right to the department. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I see Brian Annis, the undersecretary, just came in, and he can uh, catch up. Uh, I have just a few things I'd like to update you on. Um, the governor uh, released his May revise uh, budget at the end of last week. I'll defer the details of that to uh, Stephen Keck, who is going to be up shortly on your agenda to provide an update of what information that has in it uh, compared to the January proposal um, by the governor. Uh, a couple of other items of interest is since the last time we met, the uh, fast lane applications were due. These are the uh, competitive grant program within the uh, FAST Act uh, for um, freight projects as well as projects of national significance. Uh, any individual entity could only uh, apply uh, for three projects. We identified three projects. Um, but we also wrote letters of support for other entities that submitted projects under that um, a program if they reached out to us. Uh, so we're waiting to hear back, and I think it'll be a few months before we hear back on that, but we're uh, anxious to uh, see some success on fast lane competitive grant program, freight program monies coming back to the state of California. Um, I also held a town hall meeting in uh, San Bernardino in District 8. Uh, I, this is the third of my uh, town hall meetings that I've held with my staff. The first one really talked about our new strategic plan. The second one talked about uh, innovation and when we're asking the department to be innovative in the way they think exactly what that looks like. The third uh, was about partnerships and the success of partnerships and how we can take advantage of maximizing uh, the partnerships that we have. I was uh, fortunate to have uh, our two local partners in uh, Sandbag as well as RCTC join us. Their executive directors actually ended up participating in it. Um, and I think that that was a very good um, communication with staff about uh, partnerships. Um, an update on the road charge uh, pilot program. Uh, we're building off of the uh, good work that the Technical Advisory Committee did last year, led by Commissioner Bedaffer. Uh, that pilot will kick off uh, on July 1st. We were seeking 5,000 volunteers. We have just about 7,000 volunteers. We'll have to trim that down to 5,000. Uh, we have some areas uh, that we did not have uh, all the representation we wanted in that 5,000. We broke that 5,000 down into buckets, but we'll be working towards initiating that pilot as of July 1st. Uh, yesterday, this week, uh, several of us are actually piloting the technology that will be used in that pilot in our vehicles uh, throughout this week to make sure that the technology is working and we're using GPS units in some cases to verify the accuracy of that technology. Um, and uh, that's kind of a pre-pilot uh, test for the different uh, options that will be available to those who are participating um, in the pilot. In addition to that, there is FAST Act grant uh, dollars available for uh, road charge or innovative finance type opportunities. Those applications are due tomorrow. The state of California will be applying for um, a grant uh, in that FAST Act program um, and augment and increase the scope of the pilot program that we already have underway. The western states are also going to apply for a multi-state preliminary investigation um, grant as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, you may be aware that uh, May is Bike Month and in Sacramento our headquarters office is participating in all the corporate challenges, uh, but on Monday I held my annual director's bike ride and I was joined by um, bicycle advocates as well as the City of Sacramento representatives as well as uh, City of West Sacramento re uh, representatives and a good portion of my executive team so that we could see what infrastructure was built at least in that metropolitan area um, and where it has been uh, successfully deployed um, and that was a very good exercise as well. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, also um, last month or earlier this month I should say we had our 26th annual uh, Workers Memorial. Um, and we have unfortunately lost 184 employees in the line of duty since the early 1920s. We have an array of cones at that event that represents each of those individuals. We had to add one cone this year for structures construction employee who worked down in the San Diego area, Mr. Oscar Vargas, um, and his family was able to be there and join us 
um, as we honored him as well as all of those employees who have uh, uh, made the ultimate sacrifice and lost their lives in the line of duty. Uh, I will comment just on uh, a couple of agenda items. You have one, and I compliment the CTC in having an agenda, a repetitive re agenda item on new innovative uh, ideas. And I think at this meeting you will hear from Peloton. Uh, we, are, we have done a pilot program with Peloton to test um, their platooning trucks. You will see a lot more detail on that, but we are also engaged um, in that endeavor as well. The only other thing I'll, uh, I'll mention is uh, on Friday I will be down in Southern California in District 8 to celebrate the ribbon cutting of our DeVore Interchange and Cajon Pass projects. And DeVore uh, is one of our larger, one of our first, and arguably one of our most successful design build projects. Um, and it will be my honor to go down there and help them celebrate and participate in the ribbon cutting. Um, and I congratulate uh, Sandbag um, and their executive director, Ray Wolf, and it's been a great partnership in delivering that project. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks and be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Do, do you know if, <coughs> if it was Bike to Work Month, if, if Commissioner Gardino was riding his bike here from Los Gatos? <laughs> I, I actually do not know that. We'll find out. <laughs> Mr. Undersecretary. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I was going to report a few things uh, relative to the May revision of the governor's budget uh, that was released on Friday. Uh, one of the uh, two main points uh, stood out in the uh, budget summary from that document. One was a continued call to fix our broken transportation uh, finance system. And, of course, uh, the, the difficult action on your agenda today is really tied to uh, how our stip's broken and how the financing for the stip is insufficient and, and unstable. Um, you know, I always go back to what the governor said at the, the state of the state. I think two, two things that are uh, undisputable facts. One, that uh, our roads must be fixed, and uh, two, that new revenue is necessary to do that. The other uh, thing that was highlighted in the May revision was a call to move the federal freight money and uh, there are really, of course, two parts of that. There's the Fast Lane Competitive Grant Program where uh, Caltrans has submitted three applications and um, regions as well have, and locals have supported many applications or uh, submitted many applications for that. Uh, the governor's budget in May proposed uh, some language to assist the CTC should uh, one of those grants come through for the state and matching funds uh, are needed for um, uh, to meet the requirements of the federal grant. So the uh, proposal added budget bill language that would allow the CTC to allocate it through a special allocation uh, matching funds for a FAST Act grant. Uh, the second piece of it was a, a call to uh, move the formulaic federal freight funds. And uh, what was proposed there was a uh, uh, using the basic TCIF framework uh, that exists from Prop 1B, but to uh, direct uh, it out uh, through programming uh, from two sources, one, a state programming piece, and second, a, uh, a super region programming piece similar to the Prop 1B mechanism. The other thing was to add uh, the uh, sustainable freight action plan that's now in draft form and is on your agenda later today. Uh, to add that as one of the considerations that would be added to existing law when the CTC looks at guidelines for updating the TCIF. So uh, the Legislative Budget Committees have actually already acted on both of those uh, proposals in terms of the, uh, uh, the FAST Act grants. Uh, they've approved the budget bill language in both houses. In terms of the uh, language for the trade quarter investment fund they've asked that we work through the policy process of course assembly member fraser has a bill on the tcif so the direction of the budget committees was to work with the policy committees to implement statutory change for that program thank you um mr mamano don't have a choice. Susan, <laughs> you don't have a choice, by the way. <laughs> I'm good with it. You know what? I can live with that. I sleep heavy at night based on that. Susan, it's great to have you here and Will gone. 
Wait, was Will here? Sure, no, nothing. A <laughs> um, couple things. Uh, there's a notice of proposed rulemaking that came out on April 22nd. Uh, it's the big notice of proposed rulemaking. It's looking at system performance, freight, CMAC. So take a look at that, transportation.gov. That's the DOT website. You can find all that stuff there. Um, want to make sure people are commenting on that. That's going to impact everybody in here. Uh, California usually has a, a good set of comments on the rulemaking. Uh, it's not something that I can comment on uh, individually on any of the issues because it's be through the, the rulemaking process is very structured. Um, so take a look at that. If you've got comments, please submit them. Uh, and again, I think Caltrans is going to have a, a healthy set of comments in that. Uh, but I think they're they're in the right direction. I think. Uh, another recommendation would be constantly keep, and this is kind of to everybody here, constantly keep looking at our DOT website for press releases and those types of things. We're, there's a lot of things that are happening, a lot of opportunities that are coming out. They're real short notice. Uh, one example of that is under the ladders of opportunity. This is a, a movement kind of thing with uh, out of this administration where we're trying to get opportunity to the underprivileged, to the disadvantaged, and get them to where the job, the work, the jobs are, all of that type of a, an approach. Uh, I know Malcolm sat on a little talk the other day, uh, or yesterday, I think it was, at, with uh, one day this week, uh, um, with uh, somebody out of the Office of Secretary of Transportation and uh, Federal, with the Department of Transportation, and uh, there's a there's a an opportunity right now out called the Every Every Place Counts Design Challenge. Uh, the applications are due May 20th, so just in a couple days. Um, but it's an opportunity to look at uh, a locals. Um, it's a combination trying to get states and uh, tribes and locals to get together and look at a challenge that might be an existing transportation challenge that's a barrier in that, in that area. And it's an opportunity to bring out for two-day, it's a two-day design charrette type of a thing where we're bringing in resources to help just think outside the box, reimagine that whole area and see what we can do, what we can do to help and where opportunities are. So that, that closes on May 20th. Um, but there's going to be a lot of these things happening in the next eight, nine months. You can do the math. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd recommend people paying attention to that type of stuff. There are going to be quick opportunities like this that turn around. Uh, and they're, they're good opportunities. It's an opportunity to get some resources from the Department of Transportation, and we'll bring in other resources. And uh, there's been a lot of help and assistance that have been given to a lot of places on grant writing and, and those types of things, where the opportunities for funding are. Uh, and I know the Strong City, Strong Communities uh, Initiative in Fresno uh, took advantage of that, and they were able to get some, uh, um, some grants through that opportunity. Um, we signed, Malcolm, uh, Greg Netto, and myself signed a STIC charter. It's a State Transportation Innovation Council charter. Um, a couple months ago, we're going to start off our first meeting here at the beginning of June, I think it is. Uh, it's an opportunity to, Caltrans has already done this, I think, it, in innovation, and you can look and see um, through the mile marker, you can see some of the, the innovation stuff that's going on. But it's an opportunity to bring everybody else in also, bring in locals, bring in the industry, uh, and see where we can where we can spread that news, spread that information. Uh, if there's something that's happening in one part of the, the state, maybe let the rest of the state know that this is something you can do uh, to take advantage of, uh, of, of just kind of the rules and understand them all. Um, the, I want to comment on the Workers' Memorial. That was a beautiful event. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be there. Um, it, it's what a great event, um, very sincere. Uh, it was very moving for me individually, but uh, I, I, that it was just something I was very impressed with. I've been going to it for years, um, and just for some reason this this year struck me. But every year it's been just a beautiful, great way to honor the the, the people that have that have lost their lives, but uh, but also kind of to recognize the people that are out there doing the work that are in traffic. Uh, it makes you pay attention a little bit more. I, that's the sort of thing I always make sure I chat with my kids and their friends. And on prom night the other night, uh, I made sure all those kids knew that there were people out there with them, and we'll be glad to arrest them. Um, <laughs> I'm a good dad, taking pictures and lecturing all at the same time. Um, last couple things. Um, DBE, we're a lot of movement in the DBE area. Uh, I went down and had an opportunity to talk with Gerald Desmond Bridge. That's been a 
a bridge that, uh, challenge with DB. I think there's been a lot of movement there. Uh, uh, District 7 has really made an effort there and, and Long Beach, and I think they're going to get some opportunity to found some opportunity to get some involvement. But that's another area that everybody here can help the state make sure they're meeting their goal. They're a little bit under 12% right now. The goal is 12.5%. Um, it's up from 1, 2, 3% from eight years ago when I got here. Uh, so there's been a lot of effort in going into that, but it seems like there's a lot of effort going into it whereas it needs to be just the way we're working. Um, so we're trying to get past the keep doing that effort and get to the point this is how we do business. Um, so it takes everybody in this room to make that happen. Uh, and I'd argue the same thing with tribes too. I think tribes are, are – uh, there's some challenges around the state. I know uh, um, there's uh, some lawsuits that are out there. I think Caltrans is doing a great job uh, in these areas. Uh, I think the locals are doing a lot of outreach, but I think the, the biggest thing i got to always have to say is – Tribes shouldn't be commenting on a decision or on a recommendation. Tribes should be at the table while the recommendation and decision is being made. Uh, so that's just a, a cultural change, and I'm hoping that that's where we get uh, sooner than later. I think there's a lot of effort that's gone into it, so uh, I'd congratulate everybody here that's made that effort, but I, it's one of those constant vigilance, I think. Uh, Fran, you asked uh, last time about the, the – um, the bridge formula and permitting of emergency vehicles, and we're working with Caltrans. There's some state law in there, too, that kind of overlaps with federal law. So we're working with our bridge units, working with Caltrans Bridge to, to address that. There's a couple other interesting uh, interesting things that came out of that, uh, out of that little snippet in the law. So uh, Caltrans is working with that. Uh, they're the ones that are going to have to manage that. So uh, it's not for me to kind of tell them how to do it, but we're working with them to figure out how we manage that. Any questions for me? That's all I got. That's probably the finest report you've ever given. I can't argue Thank with you. you. Very much, I sir. can't argue with you. I'm on my game today. I'm feeling good about it. You're getting, you've got your A game going. There buddy. you go. I'm out of here. Okay. <laughs> regional, regional agency, circus. Stop that. I'm, I'm sorry. It's always tough to follow Vince in these <laughs> meetings. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners uh, Assemblyman Frazier, um, Sarkis Kotchek with the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments uh, Regional Agencies Moderator. Uh, first, we'd like to congratulate Ms. Branson on her first meeting as Executive Director. Uh, the regions met this morning, and similar to your full agenda, we had a lot of items to talk about, but I'm just going to focus on two items today. Uh, the first one is related to the Federal FAST Act. Um, we'd like to express our appreciation and um, thank uh, Caltrans um, on working with the regions on the implementation of the FAST Act in California. Um, we've had a really good working group um, with uh, Mr. Kome Gize, Ms. Norma Ortega, and uh, Mr. Stephen Keck related to how uh, the Federal Highway Administration funds are going to be distributed between the state and the regions. and so. We express our appreciation and um, we look forward to uh, coordination on the implementation of the freight formula funds. Uh, the second item is related to the state transportation improvement program, um, which is obviously probably the most significant item um, on your agenda related to the deletion of projects from the STIP. Um, I'd like to start off by saying um, thank you to Commission staff as well as Caltrans staff on working with us on the very difficult and painful task of identifying projects that needed to be deleted and delayed, um, deleted and delayed. Um, obviously, a lot of um, difficult choices were made, but we pre we appreciate the communication um, that happened on that process. And um, obviously, deleting seven hundred fifty-four million dollars in projects is. Um, really hard on the state, um, painful for all involved, but um, we are hoping that um, information that is shared with the legislature related to the action that your commission is going to take um, on the STIP will hopefully um, provide more information to um, expedite the process of fixing the price-based excise tax. Um, with that said, um, related to the adoption of the STIP is the uh, resolution um, for the 2016 STIP. Um, we are thankful to Commission staff for working with the regions on identifying language 
on how to treat projects that are deleted from this DIP. Um, one of which um, is uh, back to that um, identification of projects. We realize that the CTC will provide um, the legislature with a list of deleted projects and delayed projects for, um, for their information. However, um, we do have one request, and that request is that there be some language inserted directly into the resolution related to um, uh, publishing a list of projects that are deleted. This will give the regions a little bit more assurance with um, our governing boards with how projects will be treated um, once there is capacity available to program new projects. And so we have provided this insertion to CTC staff, and we hope that the commission considers this as part of the resolution. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and conclude my report and uh, take any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Rural Connie. Jerry. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Alvarado and members of the commission. Um, like the members of the RTPA group, uh, RCTF members have been uh, actively sending mem letters and uh, holding meetings with legislators. Uh, with regard to the ongoing California state transportation funding crisis. Um, today's very difficult meeting with the STIP um, speaks for itself, and your item includes a resolution um, that uh, will allow removed projects to re-enter future STIPs um, without prejudice, and we definitely support that language, and we appreciate the work of the RTPA subgroup and uh, coordination with CTC staff in developing um, language and this language that... Uh, will help things in the future and uh, addressing this very difficult challenge of deleting STIP projects. Um, <clears throat> uh, we are actively participating in discussions regarding the FAST Act and we appreciate the part partnership of Caltrans and FHWA as we uh, work to advance this new transportation bill. Um, we appreciate the efforts again of the RTPA group in developing a 60-40 split that uh, we're comfortable with and support and we um, would like to retain existing formulas for uh, distribution of funds. Um, uh, with regard to the RTP and CTP guidelines update, um, we uh, rural agencies will remain engaged in these discussions and we work, want to achieve a balance between statewide guidance, uh, performance measures, and local planning efforts and priorities and uh, representatives of the rural RTPAs will participate in work group meetings with uh, Caltrans planning staff uh, going forward, and we appreciate that. Um, we're working to stay current on numerous transportation-related bills, assembly bills that have been recently introduced. We prepared comment letters for AB 2332 and uh, AB 2094. And um, over the next year, we'll be developing more research to help better understand how rural areas can remain relevant and competitive uh, given the current statewide policies and programs related to uh, transportation. Um, with that, I will uh, conclude my comments. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, South Help Counties. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to also congratulate Ms. Branson on her new position starting out. It's a great pleasure to have her here with us. Uh, I'm going to stipulate everything that was said on the FAST Act. The Self-Help Counties has a lot of overlap with the, the regions and others. Uh, we've been working in the groups. We're also looking at the administration's proposals and appreciative of their efforts to, to make that process for implementing that program as seamless as possible. We have some... Uh, comments I think that we all are looking to make sure that get included in the final process as we work through it in uh, the next few months that are upcoming. I'd like to take a little different tone on twist on what the self-help counties has been focusing uh, a lot of time with with regards to the federal, federal government other than the FAST Act. We've had some uh, some new rule interpretations with the FAA which has uh, been taking a lot of our time. They are reinterpreting a rule from about 27 years ago with regards to excise tax on aviation fuel. Uh, the state of California, I think, has also been pretty engaged in this, but from our perspective with our local expenditure measures, it's a real, not as much a financial hit for some, although for, for the larger uh, airports in the counties, it's substantial. It's, it's millions of dollars. So there's the financial side of it, but more importantly, we think, is the impact that it has to the sanctity of the taxpayers in directing those funds to our expenditure plans, which really are the key to our success. 
Um, so we've met with FAA out in our Sacramento office. I know that they came and met with, uh, with the administration. Um, I would call it, a, this is my term, it was the airing of the grievances. They sat, we grieved, they left. Um, uh, it's uh, consistent with the federal government approach sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so it, 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 it was, I, w I wouldn't call it productive, but we certainly made our points. I think that our points uh, will be followed up with some letters. We're continuing to talk to Congress. Sorry, I couldn't resist Vince. Uh, I just had tax time, so you know, we're all feeling it. Um, so we're going to be continuing to talk to members of Congress. Congress, you know, sometimes has other things on their mind, so I don't know how much this is at the top of their list. But we certainly will be pursuing every opportunity to express the damage that this could do to really the only stable funding source over the last decades for capacity increasing programs here in the state of California, and we think a model for the rest of the nation. So all of our counties have been back to D.C., meeting with their members, talking to Chairman Schuster and others about the impact of this to our state. I'll keep you updated, uh, you know, but we're looking at every option, including any potential legal options that may be out there for us to pursue. So it's a very serious issue for us. We're taking it, uh, I think, under advisement from, from counsel, from all the agencies, and, and moving forward deliberately. Uh, but that's certainly something that we're very concerned with. Uh, the other good news on our part is I think this coming election cycle may have the largest number of potential new or extensions of existing measures. I know Diane Steinhauser has given you some in-depth reports, and I know she's anxiously uh, looking forward to doing that again in June. I'll just tell you that we've exceeded uh, 11 right now. Potentially not all of them have board approvals, but they're stepping up and looking to approve funding sources that, so that we can be there with the state and the federal government when they also have some more stability in their programs. But at the local level, they're really taking charge of programs and, and projects that, that their communities are really demanding. Self-Help Counties, uh, as an organization, has produced a video, which is on our website, which is just kind of a high-level educational piece to talk about uh, what Self-Help Counties is and what they do. We've been promoting that throughout some of the communities through social media and other things, but it's really just a, a primer for voters on what a Self-Help County is. And, and the focus of it really is a promise is made, promise is kept. And then it talks about expenditure plans and community involvement and how you build those plans to get that two-thirds support. So. We're proud of it. Uh, we're hoping that it's something that can be used to just remind people of that this is a process that includes everyone in the community from ATP to traditional you know, uh, road builders. So uh, the legislative process continues. There's a big rally uh, tomorrow at the state capitol to try and bring some focus to the need to have a stable state funding source. We're very appreciative of Chairman Frazier and his efforts to introduce legislation and the administration has their budget proposal as well as Senator Bell that has a proposal. I think as we move towards the hotter part of the summer and the end of the budget cycle, maybe we're going to come together on some, uh, some hopefully uh, principles that people can all unite behind. So we're excited to be a participant. We're not the organizers of the rally, but we think it's a great thing. And if any of you are in Sacramento tomorrow, we'd encourage you to come to the south side of the Capitol and participate and let your voices be heard. So with that, I'll be quiet, take any questions if you have them. But Thank you. Keith, on the uh, FAA interpretation on the sales tax, uh, have you reached out to our business partners? Because most of our self-help initiatives, the business community has been a strong supporter so we can get those across the goal line. And I think it might be helpful. This is We may have missed the season of everybody heading for their annual DC trip, but it's probably good to have some different voices uh, carrying that song because often they'll look at us and say, of course you want that money. Uh, we know why. So I think really uh, maybe with uh, Commissioner Dunn or Commissioner Guardino or in the real coalition, I think it would be good to really make sure that this is on the agendas of our business partners when we're back there. Thank you for that. And my cousin would like to add on, so I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just to, to let you know that, in fact, um, Orange County Business Council, which stepped up and was the leader in the, getting the community to uh, pass uh, Measure M renewed from the business perspective. So we have, a obviously, a um, heartfelt stake in making sure that the voters' promises are kept. We're making our annual trip to Washington, D.C. next week and have set meetings with Schuster and Thune and a bunch of others 
to, uh, to do this also in partnership with OCTA. I think it's a great idea. We'll raise it with the Real Coalition as well and get it on their agenda from the business perspective. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I hear they have good leadership at OCBC, so I'm confident you'll be successful. Uh, we, we, uh, we have been doing some outreach. This is an issue really that came – it was a hot and fast issue that came out uh, out of the rulemaking process. So we will be reaching out to our community supporters. And like I said, this is one that really goes to the heart of the trust of voters who have put the faith in, in, in my bosses to deliver those programs. So we appreciate all the help we can get. And I know that Daryl has, Daryl Johnson with OCTA and his staff have our letters uh, and also some background information, which I'm sure he'll be sharing with you. Um, so if you need any other tools or information from us, we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go on to policy matters, uh, I really want to thank staff. Um, we had a breakfast meeting this morning with, uh, with the chairs of both transportation committees and uh, a lot of staff and, and committee members. And it turned out very well. Um, as usual, you know, great job. Thank you very much for all the work you did this morning. Uh, Actually. Fraser, well, real quick, if I could just um, highlight just a few staff members. wanted to thank uh, Eric Thronson and Garth Hopkins and Doug Remedios for all the work that they put into that breakfast this morning. Um, we'll move on to uh, item 17. Eric? All right, commissioners. So as you're aware, this is an important time for the legislature. Uh, the budget's coming forward pretty quick. The First houses are deciding what to do with bills and which ones to send on. So uh, you'll see that uh, the staff report is a discussion on bills that the commission has taken positions on. There's some discussion about which bills are continuing to move and where they're at and which ones are not. Um, it, it, there's also, uh, we are, staff is recommending um, that the commission take position on two more bills. I'd like to discuss those bills with you real quick. Uh, and make those recommendations that you can read about them on page two of the of the staff report. So the first one uh, is AB 2428. It's a Ting bill, uh, Assembly Member Ting, uh, related to San Francisco. And it allows Caltrans to lease airspace uh, to the city and county of San Francisco for parks and recreational purposes at or above a 90% discount from fair market rent. So essentially 10% of the, of the value that they could otherwise get for rent or less. Um, staff recommends uh, that the commission oppose this bill. As you know, um, you know, existing law allows Caltrans to lease this space above or below highways, and we, we call that airspace leases, uh, for to public agencies um, in accordance with procedures that the commission adopts. Commission staff recommends that the commission oppose this bill because uh, it seeks to enrich a local entity at the cost of the state. Frankly, Caltrans estimates that the bill will result in a substantial, substantial loss of revenue, roughly almost $10 million a year uh, in revenue that they currently get for uh, parking under these uh, facilities. And commission staff is also concerned about the precedent that the bill sets, given the fact that we have so little resources for our facilities as, as it is, maybe we should not begin, uh, beginning to give away our revenue, our small amount of revenue generating uh, pieces of land that we currently have. The second bill uh, that we're proposing a uh, position on is AB 2796. It's a Bloom bill related to the active transportation program. It requires a minimum percentage of available funds, uh, ATP funds, to be awarded for planning and community engagement as well as another set aside for non-infrastructure activities. And staff recommends uh, that the commission oppose unless amended uh, this bill, notwithstanding the policies of the bill. Uh, staff has met with the author staff and uh, advocates and suggested some amendments that would make it uh, possible for the commission to implement. Uh, the author has not yet uh, made these amendments or, or made these changes to the bill. And so this time, staff would recommend that uh, the commission just oppose the bill until we can amend it. Uh, there, are, there are merits to, to, the, to the policies in the bill. However, without better definitions of terms like community engagement and what is an eligible non-infrastructure activity uh, to fund, it, it, is, it, it just creates more problems um, than, we, than we already have in the, in the ATP program. So uh, staff recommends those two positions uh, and, and recommends that the commission adopt those positions on those bills. Does anyone have any questions on either of those bills? So moved. Second. 
moved. Motion by Gilmetti, second by Dunn. Any questions? Well, we have one speaker. Uh, Jeannie Ward Waller. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jeannie Ward Waller with the California Bicycle Coalition. I want to speak about AB 2796. Um, which is, we are the sponsors of that bill, so I just want to speak directly to Eric's questions. As he said, we did meet with your staff and we heard the concerns. We do have the amendments ready, and uh, I think our, our misstep is just maybe that we haven't shared them back um, with your staff, but we did definitely. We want to um, address the concern about the question on community engagement. Our intent is that that is community engagement as part of a plan um, activity, so, the, so that um, Percentage is intended for planning activities and the community engagement that goes along with planning. Um, and then with regards to the non-infrastructure eligibility, I think that's something we're also going to clarify. It's been an ongoing discussion with Caltrans that we are trying to resolve through um, the ATP Technical Advisory Committee and we'll continue to, to work on. I know um, a lot of agencies that have those grants are, are struggling with some of those issues. So we're very committed to working on that. We want to make sure the language is um, acceptable to the commission. We definitely don't want to make um, your job any harder in administering this program. So um, I'm, I might suggest that you just put this item on hold until we do have the chance to get those amendments in print. The bill right now is sitting in assembly appropriations. So when it moves over to the Senate, we will um, make those amendments, but um, continue definitely working with staff. And we'll share, in the, in the meantime, we'll share the amendments with staff so they know what's coming. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay, on the motion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Welcome, Commissioner Gardino. Uh, with uh, Commissioner Gardino, we now have the commissioners needed. So we'll jump back up to item two, three, and four on the resolutions of necessity. Stephen? Yes, commissioners. <clears throat> item two is a resolution of necessity. I would uh, ask that the chair inquire if uh, Knox Van Dyke and Johnson or a representative or a representative of Motel 6 are present in the room? Are there, is there anybody in the room for item two? Doesn't look like it. Seeing none, staff would recommend that you approve resolution of necessity C21450. Move staff recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Arp, second by Commissioner Dunn. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Item three, Stephen. Yes, commissioners. Item three is also a uh, appearance, and here are the following instructions that will be for item three and also for item four. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three and only three issues. One, does public interest and necessity require the project? Does public interest and necessity require the project? Two, is the project placed and located in a manner that will be the most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? And three, is the project necessary? Is the property necessary for the project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired, nor deals with any other issue than the three just stated. Government Code Section 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed. The department has made the required offer. Code of Civil Procedure Section 1245.240 specifies eight affirmative votes for commission approval of a resolution of necessity. The commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of property owners Thomas and Deborah Prescott. The property is approximately 30 acres in size in the zone agricultural. The property is impacted by a $22.8 million highway widening project on State Route 65 in Tulare County. The department needs approximately 0 0.01 acres in permanent roadway easement, 0 0.08 acres in, in temporary construction easement, and 0 0.08 acres in permanent utility easement. The property owners condemn the property is not needed for the project. Mike Whiteside, the department's assistant chief engineer, is ready to make the department's presentation to be followed by the property owner or his representatives. Mike. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Mike Whiteside, the assistant chief engineer. I'm here to present on this resolution of necessity 
for a congestion relief and safety improvement project on State Route 65, District 6 in Tulare County. We are seeking a permanent roadway easement, a permanent utility easement, and a temporary construction easement, which essentially overlays the utility, yeah, permanent utility easement. We've been working with the property owners since uh, 2013, and we've uh, tried to resolve a number of issues. We've negotiated uh, several times and uh, redesigned our project several times and even paid Southern California Edison to redesign several times to try and accommodate their wishes. Currently, we are on an Im at impasse on one uh, non-compensation-related non issue, and we are asking for this resolution of necessity for the absolute minimum property rights required to meet the project purpose and need. This is the this project or this contract is the first of four phases that starts near the city of Porterville and will work its way south towards the Kern County line. This is the last parcel required to move the project. Here the blue area indicates the project limits, green is the subject parcel. Uh, the project purpose and need are to increase ve vehicular capacity on State Route 65 and to improve safety and operations. Uh, the crossroads, our county crossroads, that intersect are also being improved to make them compatible with the highway improvements. Here's an aerial view of the intersection of State Route 65 and Avenue 128. You can see the Prescott property in the upper right-hand corner. Um, this project, or, pardon me, currently Route 65 has one lane in each direction and left turn pockets at the intersection. Avenue 128 currently has one lane in each direction no turn pockets. The intersection is currently signalized. Here the blue overlay shows the completed project. Here we will have two lanes in each direction on Route 65, left turn lanes, and right turn lanes as well. On Avenue 128 we will maintain one lane in each direction, but we are adding left turn pockets. We also will be improving the signalization. Here you see a larger view of the parcel in the project area. Uh, again, the parcel is about 30.01 acres. Um, it is partially planted in orchards. The blue, of course, is the project limits. Now I'm going to show you the property rights we seek. They're going to be very small in the lower left corner of the Prescott parcel. That's 0 .09 acres of uh, easements that we are seeking. Notice that our, part, our project will impact only about 40% of the frontage of that parcel on Avenue 128. In other words, we're not taking the full frontage across the, uh, the parcel. So a bit of chronology here. The Prescotts bought the property in 2012. Um, we first started making contact with them in, what was it, December of 2012. Um, in our initial proposal, we were seeking to purchase 7.6 feet for the roadway and a 20-foot permanent Southern California Edison utility easement. In a series of meetings from 2013 to 2015, the owners requested that we minimize those property, the property sought. So our current design, the one that is uh, on the table today, is uh, what we're seeking is 1.63 feet in a roadway easement, not fee, and a 10-foot permanent Southern California uh, Edison utility easement, which is also the temporary construction easement. They asked that we add curb, gutter, and driveways, which we have done. This is the minimum property that is required that we, so that we can meet the project purpose and need. I should mention that the Southern California Edison Company has had a utility easement on this property since the 1940s, and we are required to perpetuate that easement. So here you see, oh, pardon me, currently, currently the department design is done, as is SEC. We have redesigned the project several times, so we are ready to go. Uh, they, we are county general plan compliant. We have our agreements and approvals in place with Southern California Edison and the county. And again, this is the minimum needed for the project purpose and need. So here you see a cross-section of Avenue 128 looking east. Gray is the existing pavement. Blue are the proposed improvements. And if we zoom in here, you'll see that 
25 feet from the existing center line, we are seeking a 1.63 permanent roadway easement to the back of the curb and a 10 foot utility easement for Southern California Edison. So here's what that looks like from, uh, from the air. Uh, the Prescott property is on the uh, top of the page there. Um, the red lines, which I'm afraid are rather faint, are the uh, proposed new right of way. So the yellow again indicates the 1.63 foot permanent roadway easement. The yellow hatch indicates the 10 foot uh, Southern California Edison utility easement, which is also a temporary construction easement. You'll notice on the left side of that, there's a bit of a tail sticking out. That's to accommodate uh, Southern California Edison's equipment that they've had to fit into this minimized, uh, this minimized uh, easement. And one more time from the ground, the black line is the existing right-of-way line. Uh, red is the proposed. Yellow is the roadway easement we're seeking. And the hatched yellow is the utility easement. Uh, you'll notice uh, there, there's ponding in that area that will come up a little bit later. The Prescott's pointed out that that is caused by trucks that park on their property and cause rutting in the existing uh, shoulder. So uh, as of uh, January of this year, you see that this is our proposal. This is the minimum needed to meet the project purpose and need. When we met with the Prescott's at the second level hearing, they requested we move the curb back 30 feet from the center line of the road. That would mean we would increase the roadway easement five to 5.63 feet. They were requested to keep the uh, permanent 10 foot Southern California Edison easement and asked uh, that they, they, would con they would construct their own curb gutter and driveways. They asked the state to pave to that curb gutter and driveway and they would donate the easements to the county. This is a county road. The department's response is that uh, that's very generous of the Prescotts to donate that property, uh, the easements, to the county. But our design is complete, as is Southern California Edison's. We've redesigned this several times at their request. Uh, this would require another redesign by Southern California Edison for which we would have to pay additionally, and we would be essentially paying to improve private property for speculative future development. It would also delay the project, and we offered two accommodations that would provide no resolution of necessity and no delay to the project. The first of these was a possession and use agreement. The this would allow the project to, propose to proceed as is. The owners would obtain permits and approvals, pay SEC to redesign their facilities, design and construct their curb and gutter, and ensure that their drainage and their design are compatible with the state's design. In uh, response, the department would redesign during construction and issue a contract change order to uh, meet their, their curb and gutter that they have then constructed. Uh, the owners would get exactly what they asked, the 30 foot setback to the curb and gutter. This was, um, the owners rejected this because they uh, stated at that time they wanted the department to pay for the Southern California Edison redesign. And the department again said, well, that would be essentially paying for speculative future private development. So we offered accommodation number two, which is a right of way contract. Again, this would allow the project to proceed and there would be no condemnation action. The Prescott's would construct their curb and gutter and driveway. We would redesign our project, facilitate a joint uh, utility and roadway easement, that is, we would be combining parts of the uh, county roadway easement with the Southern California Edison easement. They agreed to that, uh, the county and SEC did. The state is not a party to that. We would pave to meet their curb and gutter, and we would avoid Southern California Edison redesign. Now what that provides, however, is only 29.63 feet curb setback, not the 30. That's about 4.4 inches that we're off here. The owners rejected because they wanted the 30 foot setback and wanted the department now to construct the curb, gutter, and driveways, which we agreed to do. This was rejected. They insisted on the 30 foot setback and insisted that the department now pay for the Southern California Edison redesign and the department to pay to relocate all poles across the parcel. Uh, and they also requested we limit Southern California Edison easement rights, which they flout, flat outright refused to do. Southern California Edison has been there since the 40s. They're not giving up that right of easement. Now, 
I apologize, this has been very uh, difficult to explain. I'm going to give you some quick diagrams to simplify this to, to show you where we're at today. Oh, pardon me. Skipped ahead one. The department could not work, could not accommodate uh, their final requests because we'd be working outside our construction limits. We would be ski exceeding our project scope. We would be outside our environmental clearances, and we would again be paying for speculative future development. And again, Southern California Edison would not agree. So now the summary here. So the department design at the top, as you see it, um, two numbers uh, is at the top. That is where we're at. This is a minimum for project purpose and need. At the bottom, you see accommodation one or the Prescott request. The two numbers that are important are the 26.63 versus 30. Um, so that's that's the difference between those two. Uh, the, of course, accommodation one was rejected. Comparing that to accommodation two, uh, the two important numbers here are 30 foot and 29.63 feet, which mean we, we are about four inches off. Now, I want to remind you that either accommodation one or two would negate the need for condemnation um, and, uh, and uh, the RON, so, and allow the project to go ahead. In summary, um, the, we are providing at this point 26.63 in our current design. The Prescott's request 30. Accommodation one provides 30. It was rejected. Accommodation two. Uh, provides almost that. We are off by 4.4 inches. That was rejected. And the, the current department design is the one that is the minimum to meet the project purpose and need, the one we're asking for the condemnation action on. So related to the findings of the commission, uh, we've worked through a great number of issues since uh, 2013, many contacts with the property owners. We've addressed many issues. Um, we've had multiple redesigns of our facilities as well as Southern California Edison's and we have one non-compensation related issue uh, left and that is related to the design of the project. Related to the findings of the Commission is the project, project planned and located in a manner most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury. Uh, the property's owners contend the department must place a curb and gutter 30 foot away and pay SEC for the redesign and relocation. The department's response is our designs are complete. We would be paying for speculative future development by paying for the SEC redesign and or relocation. We'd be working outside our construction limits and it exceeds the project scope and outside of our environmental clearance. Related to an offer of just compensation being made, our first offer was in November of 2013. It was updated in January 2016. It was updated for the accommodations as late as April of this year, and our negotiations are still ongoing. So in summary, the public interest and necessity require the proposed project. The project is planned and located in a manner most compatible with greatest public good and least private injury. The property sought to be condemned is necessary for the project, and an offer of compensation has been made. Uh, we ask for your support for this resolution, and uh, District 6 Director uh, Bender Eckhart is here with me, and we'd be happy to answer questions. The owner here? The owner is here. Mr. Chair, I have one question before the owner makes a presentation. So uh, this appears to be a, a monetary issue. Or, or why are we listening to it? It's a design issue, I believe. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that, but well, I'll go ahead and listen. Uh, Michael, where are you? <clears throat> if I saw one of those uh, exhibits correctly, most of the right of way take was on the south side. Of the it was all on the south side. Yes, south side. it Thank was you. all on the south side. Yes, and it's all easements. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Hendrick, and I'm a right-of-way appraiser, an MAI, an ARA, and appraisal certified by the International Right-of-Way Association. I am also the daughter of Tom Prescott, Debbie Prescott, my brother Joe Prescott, and Paul Prescott are also here. Unfortunately, I disagree with almost everything that Mr. Whiteside just presented. Uh, we are here today to request that commission deny or postpone the resolution of necessity for the benefit of the state. 
We are of the opinion that the remaining issues can be resolved with some minor modifications and proposed plans and the willingness of Caltrans to work with us. It seems unfortunate that property owners such as my parents would be unable to come to a consensus after three and a half years of discussions with Caltrans. Essentially, when you, especially when you consider the fact that we have offered to give, or maybe better stated, donate more land than required and are willing to install at our own costs the site improvements just to ensure that the project is well designed. We are not asking for any compensation for our property. We just want it to be done right. And again, we are willing to pay for it. Let the record reflect that we are in no way opposed to the taking of our property for the project. We see good need for the road improvements to be made along Teapot Dome Avenue and its intersection with Highway 65. Also, please keep in mind that the project limits, as currently proposed, terminate in the middle of our property. And although it is such a tiny and small acquisition off of our property, the project's poor designs have huge impacts on our continued farming of the property. We are asking you to reconsider the design as it affects our property. Once again, we are not opposed to the widening of Teapot Dome, but we are opposed to the poor planning and short-sightedness that has gone into the design along the stretch of the project. <clears throat> I grew up on a small farming, family-owned farm. Who orig we originally got our start in Orange County back when they grew oranges. My parents chose to give us important life lessons that came along with farming and for that reason moved to Porterville where they grow oranges, lemons, and persimmons today. With that said, I think it is very important to note that my parents are well versed in the challenges of farming in a developing area, especially when poor planning has taken place due to hasty design and lack of foresight. I would like to bring to your attention the very first page in of your memorandum under tab three of your agenda today. Please note that the very last paragraph states, the owner's primary concern and objection expressed by the property owner, I'm sorry, the primary concern and objection expressed by the property owner is that the, the subject property is not necessary for the completion of the project. I am not sure if this is a typo or misunderstanding by whomever it was that wrote up the memorandum, but we're not here today to contest the necessity of the project. We are here to reiterate our concerns as expressly written to you on April 12, 2016. That is the last two pages of attachment D of your handout that you have in front of you. It states that the planned project is not the most compatible with the greatest public good and the least private injury. We are very cognizant that you do not have the time today or even want to hear all the details that have transpired over the last three and a half years but we want to point out a few key points and give you a little background information to bring this matter to a vote. The property was purchased by my parents in November 2012, at which time the property had been vacant and only dry farmed for several years. Negotiations had already begun with the prior owner before escrow was even opened on the property. Shortly after escrow closed, we were contacted by Caltrans and presented with the former off owner's offer. We immediately informed the agent that we would need to see project plans in order to evaluate the impacts on our property, as we were going to develop the property with permanent citrus tree plantings and install a fence and gates along the property's perimeter. A complete farm map was provided to Caltrans for review and full disclosure of our plan for the property was made from the very beginning. We also feel it's important to note that if you turn to the first page of attachment B of your agenda that is entitled Parcel Panel Report and look at the last paragraph above the bullet points, it indicates, based on the owner's initial concerns, the department has tried to reduce or eliminate the area needed for the subject property. Contrary to, what, to everything that was presented here to you today, is it it is extremely important that you know that we have never asked for a reduction in size of the road easement. We, may, we unlike typical property owners, um, came at it at a different approach. Just because our initial answer was that we need more information to better understand the project should by no means suggest that the, that the department reduce the road easement area. 
We requested that instead of tapering the acquisition of the road, that they take it in a straight linear strip across the, the frontage, which would square up the land and allow us to better efficiently plant uh, the trees and utilize the remainder. It should be noted that shortly after providing Caltrans with a copy of our farm map and plans for the property, the fence was constructed by my dad and, and brother, five and a half feet behind the original proposed acquisition area. We did this in order to save the state from paying for it or relocating it later. We felt that we were acting in good faith and that, it, that this was not required or expected us, for us to do so, but showed our willingness to work the, with the department to achieve the common goal of public safety along this well-traveled corridor. To clarify, the only rejection that was asked for was, was the Southern California Edison easement area that was arbitrarily placing power poles in the middle of our farm road and at our gates, effectively causing us to lose truck and tractor access to our property during harvest season. Over the past several years, the property has been fenced, a well developed irrigation system installed and trees planted, which is contrary to the most recent appraisal that Caltrans has provided stating it's developed with almonds. Our only conclusion for this misrepresentation is that our property, that the staff member may have inspected the wrong property and mistaken our neighbors for ours. Another glaring misrepresentation of the owner's concerns can be found on page five of your attachment B. The statement is made that the owner's offer to dedicate additional area is unexpected. Nothing could be further from the truth. It has been very clear that compensation is not being sought, yet all legal documents and contracts that have been provided for signature do not take this into consideration. The very last page of tab three under attachment E of your agenda is a letter dated April 26, 2016 from the Acquisition Condemnation Branch Chief, which states, once you have reviewed the documents, she will be happy to meet with you again to resolve the remaining concerns and execute the contract and deeds necessary to convey the required right-of-way for the project. We promptly met with the right-of-way agent to resolve the remaining concerns, at which time we provided her a written request of changes to be made. On the following day, we received an email from the right-of-way agent stating, we are unable to make the modifications you have requested, which suggests that they are no longer negotiating good faith or hoping to reach an amicable settlement. This is unfortunate, but in line with some of the very first words uttered by a former right-of-way agent assigned to our property that said, if you do not sign, this will cost you a lot of money. Between the threats of eminent domain, accusations of not allowing staff to enter the property, intimidations by staff reminded us that they have a lot of attorneys on staff, and claims that we have removed, removed surveyor stakes this process should never be attempted by the faint of heart. Some additional background information that's important and that you should know about is that we are working with the County of Tulare and the Resource Management Agency Interim Director on installing our own curb and gutter at 29.63 feet north of the section line. We have secured a permit from the County of Tulare and the construction of the curb and gutter are waiting on elevations to be set by the county in conjunction with Caltrans. At this point, at this time, we would, we would grant the County of Tulare an easement over the portion Caltrans is looking to acquire along with additional right-of-way. The dynamic nature of this portion of Teapot Dome is not clearly reflected in any of your exhibits provided to you today. The area is in dire need of road improvements, and like I stated earlier, we are not here to oppose that fact. We are here to show that with just a little more forethought, into the design and forward approach to engineering, a, a plan can be designed not only to raise its level of service in the area, but, do, but actually do something to make it safer and better. If there is time to do it once, there's time to do it right. To all the private property owners in this room today, sitting on the opposite side of the table has been an experience I will never forget. Never would I have imagined that my experience as a right-of-way appraiser, that the system was designed to wear the property owner down, threaten, provide empty promises, 
false hope and have an utter disregard for private property owners' time and resource. We know that this process is fair and essential for public safety now and for future generations. Again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your time and attentiveness. We would be happy to answer any questions you have for us now or at any other time in the future. We know that to the state of California, this is tiny, but to us, it's everything. As for the pending vote at hand, we request that commission deny or postpone the resolution of necessity for the benefit of the state. Yes, can you put up those accommodations? I'd like your, if you could comment, comment on the accommodations that they say they offered you, whether they did or didn't, I don't know. packet that's getting handed out to you this is the most ex the recent exhibit that we've seen I've never seen the, the original one that he had put up in front of you today so this was a combination one could you comment on that comment up there that first thing we're, we're doing that right now um, obtaining permits and approvals it's uh, we're waiting for the county to stake it and uh, I gave uh, the um, Caltrans engineers a uh, card um, to the county so that they can uh, uh, the work elevation. together to set the elevations because uh, right now we don't need a permit to put in the uh, the curb but we want to make sure that we put it in so that it drains and it'll match what you folks do. Yeah, we don't I want to sabotage your uh, plans. I get, I get that. But how about the rest of Okay, the, the design, the, the SCE? Um, there, will the, be, there is no needed SCE redesign. I don't know where that comes from. So oh, their design as is? As yeah, the design is staying as, as is it in order to accommodate it our curve. It does not affect us. Um, it was the, I think it was the wording in the, um, there's a lot of inconsistencies that when we have a meeting, we walk out of it with Caltrans or with Caltrans and the county, walk out of the meeting, everybody's in agreement, they're going to draft up documents, and as soon as we get the documents, it's something completely different than all of us walked away from the table. And that's the inconsistencies that we have found throughout this entire process, lack of communication and follow through on what was actually agreed to during the meetings. So it's mostly just a verbiage thing, and when we ask to get things changed, all of the highlighted areas, things that we've asked to, to be changed or to clarify, page 31, we've told that uh, no changes can be made. Pages 31 and 36. Let me ask you a question. <coughs> if, if, the, if you didn't have to pay for a redesign, or would, would you agree with that, or would you pay for a redesign if it was necessary? For Southern California Edison there no redesign is necessary to if, accommodate for if the there, if there was uh-huh would you agree to pay for the redesign I don't think we should pay for a redesign I don't think there's any need there's no there uh, for one and I don't know what the better the greater good is serve the public good is by uh, Edison company increasing the, their line size from an engineered pole at the west side of my property one-third the way in on my property and then going down to a smaller line size, I don't see where the public good is served by that. Okay, can we pull up accommodation two? What are we? We did, uh, none, it says. None of, their, none of the papers here that uh, we have for the, that they've asked us to sign uh, shows 
uh, Caltrans putting the curb at 30 foot. Or 29.63. Either way. Okay, they, but they have one design, and that's at uh, 18 inches. And in this one says avoid, avoids redesign, so there's no money involved in that. So th does this give you what you want? That's, it, it says that the owner rejected it because we wanted it 30 Forget, feet. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you, they said that, but would, th does this accommodation work for you? Owners yes. Mm -hmm. Part, yes. Yes, it does. I think we have a solution. Well, I heard some questions about Edison's position there, and I just want to be clear that we really don't control Southern California Edison's, so that's what their line size, they say, is a utility solution, yeah. I know, but they, I, I, it was a very confusing discussion to most of us in terms of what we were understanding. Well, a lot of people. It's been a very confusing process. So May I ask you a question? Maybe, maybe to, uh, to clarify, I could say that today, right now, the Edison Company has a 12-inch easement out there. I am proposing to give them a 12-foot easement. I want to give a 10-foot easement to the county. Uh, I want to donate all the property and we can't get the we can't get the, and I will also construct the curb and gutter we can't even get the language uh, right I, I, I hear you it sounds like we may have an agreement but we'll let the department respond uh, could I just ask one question uh, do you uh, are you accepting the 30 the 29.6 is that the area of contention the 29.6 you you don't want, you want a 30, right? No. We'll take the 29.63. Yeah, but if that's where they're actually constructing, their plans do not show that that's where they're actually constructing it. Well, let me get that straight. That, is the 30 foot absolutely necessary, or can no. you live with the 29.6? We can live with the 29, and we and agree can the, to that. And can the, can the state engineer, can you live with it? Or do you have to have the 30? Sorry. Or, uh, Commissioner Burke. Uh, right now, I hold in my hand the right-of-way contract that states exactly what is up there. Okay. We have not done the design yet because that would be wasting state resources to redesign another option. We've designed several okay. times, but we have indicated in writing in a right-of-way contract that was submitted to the property owners, this is what we were willing to do. Okay, and you'll do the 29.6, I mean 6.3. Correct. You'll accept that, and they'll accept that. That's where the curb is located. The plans that the exhibit we have does not show the curb at 29.63 feet. Okay, the, the, the why, issue why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? I'm going to do a timeout. <laughs> you guys go in that room over there and come back with a solution. It looks like you already have one. But I'd like to say one thing. The, 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 the deal or the, the paper that they want us to sign, we would have signed it. The county called us and said, why aren't you guys signing it? And we said, have you read it? And he says, no. And we read it together, and he says, now I see why you're not signing it. There's too many inconsistencies in, in the contract. And that's why we're not signing the contract. There's too many inconsistencies. Okay, come down no, to the fine out. details. Okay, time out. Everybody seems to I think we all, that everybody's agreeing. So walk out the door, come back with the deal. And we'll be done with this. Okay. Can I just <clears throat> have uh, your resolution and necessity? There's a legal um, legal description of the land to be taken. When you uh, agree uh, on the uh, on it, it the legal description says the land taken will be 1.63 feet. There will uh, be no, there'll be no reason. If you guys come to an agreement, we won't have I, a resolution. I, I, I think we sh we shouldn't even be here today. Okay, so head on out. I know we have another one. Um, Michael, are you presenting the second one too? Do you have somebody that can meet with these folks out there, or is it going to be you? We do. Okay. Get right away here. If, uh, if you folks would just step right out into the, the entryway there, and we'll put that. Okay, this one's on a timeout. Now we're going to go to item number three. welcome. Thank you. 
It's actually, commissioners, it's item number four. Oh, item number four. Okay. And, and again, uh, the legal mumbo jumbo is the same for this one as for the prior one. Uh, uh, and uh, on this one, the commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of property owner Lancy Villalobos. The property is approximately 31,977 square feet in size and is zoned commercial. The property is impacted by a $12.4 million safety project to realign a curve and improve an intersection on State Route 76 in San Diego County. The department needs the entire parcel. The property owner contends the property is not needed for the project and is opposed to a roundabout. Again, my white side the department assistant chief engineer is ready to make the department's presentation to be followed by the property owner or her representative. Thank you again, Stephen. And I'm back. Uh, this pro this uh, resolution is for a safety improvement project, District 11, San Diego County. Um, we are seeking to acquire the property in full, yet there is two outstanding issues. This project is located in rural northern San Diego County uh, in the Puma Valley uh, at the intersection of State Route 76 and Valley Center Road. It is proposed to replace the existing intersection with a roundabout and to realign portions of State Route 76. Uh, there, this is the last of four parcels needed for the project. Here you see a street view of the parcel. It is about 0.73 acres zoned commercial and is currently rented to a fruit stand. The owner states that she planned to develop the parcel into a juice bar, but no development plans were provided to Caltrans and none have been filed with San Diego County. Here's an aerial view of the, uh, pro uh, the project area. In the north, indicated in orange here, Ms. Villalobos owns several parcels, including her own private residence. In November of 2010, the department contacted property owners in the uh, project region to uh, request permission to enter. That's necessary so that we can perform engineering and environmental studies for preliminary design. Later that same month, Mrs. Villalobos called us and asked us to realign State Route 76 uh, to the south of, and to avoid uh, impacts to her northern parcel. In March of 2011, Caltrans met with Mrs. Villalobos to discuss the project, all the alternatives, all the impacts, and the acquisitions, at which time she stated she had no qualms with the project. Yet in September of 2011, Mrs. Villalobos purchased the subject parcel shown here in green, which you'll notice is south of Route 76. The project, the project area is further constrained by an environmentally sensitive area shown here in red. It has cultural resources as well as the Waimea Creek, which is also to the west. So the existing facility has several uh, deficiencies or several non-standard features. Uh, first of all, coming down the hill, there's a 7 to 8 percent downgrade, followed by a series of reversing curves that uh, cause uh, sight distance problems. and Further, the skew uh, with Valley Center Drive also inhibits uh, sight distance. Again, this is a safety project. The purpose and our need are to reduce the number and severity of accidents on State Route 76. Uh, between 2005 and 2009, there were 35 total, which is over four times state average. There were four fatalities, over 19 times state average, and 19 injuries. The causes are speeding and a failure to yield. Now, the project report done in 2014 considered several alternatives, including no build, realign State 76 and signalize the intersection, or realign State 76 and install a roundabout at the intersection. Pardon me. Um, I must state that I, for, pardon me, but the last accident out there was November of 2015, so this, this area still has problems. The uh, option of signalizing the existing intersection uh, was not considered in the project report. That's because it doesn't, the, it doesn't straighten out the curves to the east, uh, and the current intersection doesn't meet standards for signalizing the intersection. Therefore, it didn't meet the project purpose and need. We also considered moving the intersection to the south and to the east, uh, but both of those required between one and three uh, acres of additional property, and they didn't necessarily miss the, the subject parcel. In fact, one of them still took the entire subject parcel. 
So uh, the no build option was discarded and realign and uh, realigning the highway and doing a state a roundabout was the preferred alternative. A 2010 study concluded that uh, there are crash reductions of up to 35 percent for all crashes and 76 percent for injury crashes when an intersection is converted from a signal to a roundabout. So uh, here you see the subject parcel and first I'm going to show you what a signalized intersection would look like. Here you go. Uh, again, it essentially takes the entire parcel as well. And now if we look at the roundabout alternative, here it is again, it is uh, overlays the subject parcel as well. Uh, notice we in all alternatives did miss the northern parcel uh, up there in the orange, Mrs. Villalobos's home parcel. A close up of the roundabout option here. Uh, this roundabout is designed for a California legal truck. So if a truck doesn't require a permit to travel on our roads, it can travel through this roundabout fine. There are over 3,500 modern roundabouts in the United States. Uh, there are sidewalks included in this uh, project. That's because there is a bus stop, the North County Transit District. There's also a school bus stop for the Valley Center Palma Unified School District, and they are required by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So related to the findings of the commission, uh, we've resolved a great number of issues with Ms. Villalobos over, over time. You can see the many contacts and meetings we've had. But there are two issues that are outstanding, specifically the use of the roundabout and the need for the parcel. Related to the finding that the project is planned and located in a manner most, most <coughs> in a manner most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury, the property owner contends that a roundabout is dangerous, useless, and wastes taxpayer money. A signalized intersection would be better. The department's response is that this is a safety project and studies have shown that roundabouts uh, do reduce the accident number and severity. Uh, the roundabout best meets the project purpose and need and overall the cost difference of a, with a signal is only about 11% less. Related to finding that the property sought to be condemned is necessary for the project. The property owner contends that the department project could be designed to avoid the parcel by moving it to the west. The department's response is both alternatives require a full take of the uh, a full acquisition of the parcel. Um, the options to the west are limited by the environmentally sensitive area and Waimea Creek and Bridge. And the other alternatives to completely move it, move the intersection to the south or to the east require quite a bit of additional parcel property and uh, also bisect uh, another property. Related to the finding that an offer of just compensation has been made, uh, we made the first offer in October of 2015. It was revised in May of 2016 based on the property owner's uh, appraisal and our on negotiations are ongoing. With that, the public interest and necessity require the project. The project is planned and located in the manner most compatible with greatest public good and least private injury. The property sought to be condemned is necessary for the project and an offer has been made. District 11 director uh, uh, is, the <laughs> pardon me, uh, Lori Berman is here with me and we'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions before I'll call the property owner? Is the property owner present? Yes, the property owner is here. Good afternoon. I appreciate your hearing from me. It took me 15 hours to get up here because I stopped off at Monterey to see my daughter. I saw a great deal of your work. It's amazing, except I'd redo the 101. Okay. I'm brief. I got one page. I need my I'm going to read it to you because if I start to talk to you, you'll never hear the end of it. I totally agree with what the last people said. And that is that many of the things that he tells you sound like they're really true, but they're really not. When I went to the meeting, the second meeting that was caused by these people, to hear what they had proposed for this roundabout, 
which, by the way, is a flavor of the month. It has nothing to do with Palma Valley. Can you bring up that picture, the very first one, perhaps, or the second one? I don't care which one you do. Highway 76 is a main arterial highway. It runs from Oceanside all the way to where it dead ends, about 20 miles above my house. That Go back one. Go back one. Any, any one of these are good. <laughs> there, that one's fine. You can see Highway 76 there. The speed limit on Highway 76 is 55 miles an hour. And the road coming into it, which we call S6 or Valley Center Road, is 50 miles an hour, recently reduced to that because the casino that's down the road a little bit where you can't see it um, asked for that. I maintain that putting in a stoplight is all you need here. You don't need to change the road. You don't need to change the curves. Why do I say that? Because if you go up 76, there's 20 more curves that are as bad as this one. If you go down the road, you've got the same thing. You're talking about a country road in the middle of nowhere. The only reason we're talking about redeveloping it now is because there's casinos there. Four. Four casinos, five tribes, six tribes, counting La Jolla. So I used to be able to drive all the way from Escondido up to where you see my ranch there. I could never see another car. There was nobody out there. Of course, that was a few years ago. I've lived there 36 years. This intersection has always been a problem. If you're coming down Valley Center Road, people tend to not realize there's a stop sign there, and they go right on through it, right onto the vacant lot across the way, taking anybody who happens to be on 76 right along with them. I personally have witnessed over 15 deaths on that road since I've lived there. But most of them have been above where you see my property, the yellow piece there. That curve is more dangerous than the curve where the light is. And the only difference I recommend that you make, which would fit right into your plans because it would save you about 7 to $8 million, is to put in a stoplight. When you put in the stoplight, as they did down the road from us coming into the which one is that? Palma Reservation Casino. They put in two warning signs on either side and said, hey, guess what? There's a stoplight ahead. They reduced the speed limit to a great deal. They went, if they went down to 35 at this corner, coming in to the intersection, you'd solve probably 70% of the problems. 30% of the problems are drunks. I don't care what you do about that. You're not going to solve it. They're still there, girl. They're going to drive too fast. They're coming from the casino. They're mad. They just lost their entire week's salary. And they're going to have to explain that to Mama. And they come to that stop sign there and they go, whoa, what's this? <coughs> right through it. So if you really want to solve this problem in a good manner for the people that live out there, you'll just put in a stoplight with the warning lights. That's all that's needed. You don't need to take my property and my neighbor's property and you don't need to bring in 500 loads of dirt to fill it you don't need to do any of the things that they're proposing here we certainly don't need sidewalks most people live on 20 acres what are they going to do come down and walk around your little roundabout there i mean the whole project is somebody's great idea i agree with him that it will probably kill less people if that was your only intent however some people the the people that have recently been killed Four out of the five were drunk. So I don't know how you're going to stop that. I think, honest to tell you the truth, that everything that I've told you is true. And I don't care about what they're going to give me for the price. By the way, I bought that piece of property. I'm 70 years old. I had six kids. I have 10 grandkids, a few more on the way. I bought that piece of property so I would have something to live off of. It's real hard when you get to my age to be picking blackberries anymore. The orange trees will always be on me. I needed a generator, so I bought the piece of property, which was commercially zoned, in order so I could sit there all day long and have people come in and out, and they'd buy our stuff, and I would pay, you know, get paid for that. That's all gone. I'm fine. We came to an agreement about what, what they're going to pay me after I got my own appraisal and came down 20000 from what that appraisal told them. But I'm giving up my right to that piece of property for the next 20 years if you put this silly roundabout there. I understand that roundabouts are something that is the flavor of the month. I've said it before. It's something that they're interested in. It's interesting because everybody's going the same way, and they do tend not to run into one another. But there's not a single accident 
on that road except for the ones coming up from Valley Center Road that ran into somebody on Route 76 that have been head-ons. They've all been single car accidents, usually great big trucks, run off the road, kill themselves and their hitchhikers. So I don't see the point of it. I don't see the point of wasting your money on this. It's my property, but you can do what you want with your money. Okay. Ted, do you have any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Can I see the uh, diagram of the traffic light? They did, by Option. the way, make it. But they made it. Uh, what they're saying is it has to be, it has to come into a square. And I keep saying, what for? It's fine the way it is. Just leave everybody alone and just put a stoplight in right where it is today. I don't know if I can tell you from here. Coming down the road, before you get to the green property there, you'd put in some kind of a signal light that says, slow down, there's light ahead. Hopefully, up on my, my property, the yellow property, you put in a big sign that says 35 miles per hour. That doesn't mean anybody will go that because they're coming off of Palomar Mountain. But certainly it will tell them that it's there. If they choose to ignore it, then, then they deal with it. The stoplight should be right there at the corner. You don't have to move anybody. You don't have to do anything. You're not going to spend $8.2 million. And that's the reason I'm here today. We already agreed about what they're going to pay me for it if, if, if you decide not to do my suggestion. But I don't see any point in it. So um, I'm assuming that the Caltrans design for the stoplight option, which you've already said uh, you uh, ha have opted for the roundabout, but this would uh, meet what state standards, federal standards? What what does it require? Does it no longer? I'm sorry. The new design would. The current design does not meet standards for signalizing the intersection. We cannot signalize. We cannot signalize the intersection as it is today. Can we signalize without a problem? No, it cannot. No, it cannot. It has to be, the roadway has to be a realigned. You have to have, I think it's a, a minimum of a 75 degree angle between the streets. Right now we're at something like 65 an, uh, degrees uh, skew. And so it has to be realigned before we can add a stoplight to this intersection. already know where this stoplight is. The people that we're having the problems with are the people who are drunk and the people coming out of the casinos that are mad. They don't know where they are. They're in the middle of nowhere because this truly is the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I, I can see them coming down off the grade in those big water trucks, 80,000 pounds, and going right through your beloved little roundabout. But I can also see the people coming on Valley Center Road at 50, 60 miles an hour and going right through it. I don't see how you can prevent people from doing stupid things in their car. I don't. And I've lived there for 36 years. If I'd have thought of this, I would have already told you. Okay. Well. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned you're putting in sidewalks. Yeah. Because there's for? a school bus stop there. What, what are the statistics on pedestrian safety with the roundabout? I would be concerned about little kids starting if there's a roundabout. Thank you for bringing that up. I talked to the state's uh, expert on roundabouts up in traffic ops, and he told me there has been not one uh, reported death in uh, the United States on a modern roundabout. Uh, pedestrian. There, is, no, there are no. 3,500 roundabouts installed throughout the United States. There is not one recorded pedestrian fatality at a single one of those roundabouts. But first of all, we don't know if there really are kids getting off the bus right here, the no people? They do. Right there at the corner, the stage stop, which is the little store that's up above any of the actual intersection, the buses stop there to pick up children to go down to Palma School. They stop there every day. My kids went to school out there. Never heard of an accident there either, 36 years worth. No Mr. roundabout. Mr. Chair, one other statistic is they cited the reduction in accidents as somewhere in the neighborhood of 35%, I actually think it's higher than that. A reduction in injuries in excess of 
Uh, a modern day roundabout also reduces fatalities by 90 plus percent. And one of the reasons that it's so successful, uh, as was pointed out by the property owner, is for imp impaired drivers, we have a problem here. Problem partially is lent to those impaired drivers. Uh, a roundabout has huge advantages for impaired drivers because an impaired driver is likely to run a stoplight or a stoplight or a stop sign periodically. A roundabout is a much better configuration to address that issue because you will uh, essentially eliminate the opportunity for T-bone intersections. So that's another reason why this intersection will operate much safer with a roundabout as opposed to a signalized intersection. Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't think we need to debate roundabouts versus traffic lights anymore here. It's pretty, uh, pretty clear to me from, from the, this that uh, whether or not it's a roundabout or a traffic light, that green piece of property is, is, is going to be taken to do the project because Caltrans has certain uh, standards that they have to build to. They're not going to build according to the, what the, the landowner would like to see. Uh, and maybe uh, you do have a legitimate uh, viewpoint from, you know, from your viewpoint, but the fact is Caltrans isn't going to build a project that they don't meet standards with. So, you know, to me, whether it's a roundabout or a traffic light, that piece of property is toast. <laughs> so kind. I would just point out that I would agree with your statement about the roundabouts if the speed limits were different. Highway 76 is the major arterial highway through there. It's 55 miles an hour. The people that drive through there going to the casinos only come out there maybe, what, every other weekend, every month, whatever. They don't know what the speed limit is, and they're coming at 50 and 60 miles an hour. So unless you slow that traffic down, you're going to have the same problem, whether you put in a light or whether you put in anything else. There's one quick question, uh, Mrs. Beer Lobos. Um, you bought the property right here. It's hard to know who's talking because <laughs> okay. you're behind you. Exactly. Um, if I understood the presentation, Caltrans started talking to you about this in about 2005. 2010, they said, which I don't believe, but okay. Okay. And then you bought the property in 2011, that green piece of property. Yep, that's why I don't believe it, because when I bought the piece of property, the realtor, who I've known for the 36 years I've lived on, he sits on the Uwema Water District with me. So I've known him for a long time, and he said to me, you know, there's a possibility they might do this. He said, this is one of the people that came to the meeting to tell the people there what they thought about the roundabout idea. And he said, this is so crazy. They'll never do this. Yeah. The, the only, <laughs> I, I asked that because perhaps um, it would be interesting to see. That was, there was a substantial amount of letters, phone calls, emails, even more than our previous um, uh, uh, record of decision. Uh, that surprised me that this wouldn't, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of documentation. Well, in the, does in it the beginning. Does it date back to 2005? No. Not even well, close. We're going to need to wrap this up. Not yes, even 210. 2010. Uh, thank you. Maybe the residents to the valley, but not to this. Is this yours or mine? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I move staff recommendation. Second. Motion by Hart, second by Cavalloni. Further questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, no, please, please do a roll call vote. Somebody check on the progress we got in the hall before we start moving along. Uh, yeah, we can do that. It's one time only. And actually, okay, we'll take ten minutes. Uh, I understand the webcast has been down. Is that is it back up? Okay. The what? Well, then you missed your pass. You, you missed the break. Okay, we've got, uh, we'll be back at 10 minutes after 3.